transform the space into the site where these voices and the images they can create meet and merge. Does this strategy picture what the political theorist Chantal Mouffe has called the antagonistic pluralism of radical democracy, where different forces are able to argue their differences within a dynamic democratic public field? She has proposed that, the ra that rational consensus is the death knell of democracy, stating that a healthy democratic process calls for a vibrant clash of political positions and an open conflict of interests. Or does it instead heal the failures of 21st century democracy, whereby politics has been displaced by morality and people identify along ethnic, religious or nationalist lines, generating antagonisms which, as she puts it, cannot be managed by the democratic process? In order to adequately address the uh, concerns raised, we need to look beyond the domain of art history and theory towards a more integrated field of social research. And today we have invited four speakers from a range of different backgrounds to give us their perspectives. The Oslo-based curator um, and critic Will Bradley was meant to start off the day responding to the question, is our current model of democracy in crisis? But I'm afraid due to the weather and illness, he's actually, been unfo um, he's actually unable to attend. I'm just going to introduce that topic um, a little bit more and hopefully we can come back to the themes raised um, during the discussions as well. In 1989, Francis Fukuyama famously announced the victory of liberal democracy and the end of history. Two, days after, two, days, two decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union, what is our current position? In contrast to Fukuyama's pre um, prediction that democracy would become ever more prevalent, in a recent interview in Al Jazeera, Slavoj Zizek cited the examples of China and Singapore noting that the supposed inherent link between capitalism and democracy no longer exists. In the era of globalisation, are we in an end game of democracy? And if, as we are so often told, apathy is pervasive in our individualist consumer culture, what effect does this have on our, our current model of democracy? Ian McWhirter, the political commentator for the Sunday Herald and Herald, We'll tackle our second question. In an article published in early 2009, he asked, as countless billions of taxpayers' money is handed to the private banks, why is no one demonstrating against socialism for the rich? More recently, he noted that in the 21st century, something has rotted the moral fabric of democracy, before going on to suggest that in Scotland at least, student fees may mark a turning point in public reaction igniting protests the like of which we haven't seen since the poll tax in 1988. Today he'll respond to the question, does sanctioned protest have any impact? Michael Hart and Antonio Negri open their book Multitude with the striking declaration that the possibility of democracy on a global scale is emerging today for the very first time. Along with many others, they argue that democracy is a fundamentally incomplete project that has never achieved its goals and must now be reinvented in response to rapidly changing economic, social and te technological realities. Professor Sarah Oates specialises in the study of media and democracy in the Department of Politics at the, uh, at the University of Glasgow. She will consider the rather daunting dual question how will democracy evolve in the future and who are the radicals of the future? And she's renamed her section, Will the Revolution Be Podcast? The Internet, Images and Politics of the Future. And finally, we'll return to the art world with a presentation from the curator, Tona Nielsen, whose practice is concerned with the intersection of art and activism. Her question, can art offer anything more than aesthetic commentary? challenges not only the role and potential of art, but also its institutions and its viewers. Is art capable of doing anything, or should it restrict itself to representation? These debates are of course far from new, but the various manifestations of art's most recent social turn have perhaps brought to the fore a range of additional perspectives and considerations. Nicholas Burio's Relational Aesthetics Attempt to attempted to reposition art 
from a good to a service-based economy. Theorising the practices of artists who sought to construct provisional microtopias through setting up platforms for face-to-face -face interactions and the formation of temporary communities, usually within the gallery space. And at the other end of the spectrum, artistic practice is often overlapped with and is indistinguishable from activism itself, intervening in social realities, raising awareness and producing social knowledge. In a recent article, the critic Stephen Wright has discussed artworks that possess what he calls a low coefficient of artistic visibility. In other words, artists that do not need to be visible as art in order to operate. Marked out by a process-based approach which rejects the production of a finished product and embraces co-authorship, the significance of these practices lie in their, and I'm quoting, scant concern for the usual criteria of showing and disseminating, as well as the rejection of the conventional mode of spectatorship. According to Wright, this shift transforms viewers of art into users of art. The term instrumentalization generally attracts a degree of dismay in the context of culture, where we often seem to harbor a kind of phobia of functionality. But when art is, present, when art is pressed in the direction of activism and critique, rather than government policy, bureaucratic box ticking, or the demands of the market, does it require that recuperation? So in summary, power, protest, participation, globalisation, the image, the media, technology and the role of art are all subjects that we hope will be addressed over the next few hours. Right. <laughs> We've got a lot to get through.